cat, but but I'm curious to I'm curious to find out what what, what exactly that entails. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kai Gay. Well, awesome! It is so good to be here. Uh, thanks for having me, Dr. Pointer. Um, yeah, so my name is Maddie Davis. I am currently a graduate research assistant at the University of Wyoming. Today I'm going to be talking about some of my past experiences with the Sphere Club and other experiences at SWAC, as well as some of my undergrad experiences at the University of Wyoming. So, um, my time at SWAC, I was here, I started during fall of 2017, and I was here up until spring of 2022. Um, so I became involved in quite a few different uh, things while I was here. I was part of the women's soccer team for a little bit and the track and field team. Um, I was involved in the Associated Student Government. Uh, I was an RA for one year and I was also a tutor on campus. So those were all really awesome experiences and they really helped me feel connected to the SWAC and Coos Bay North Bend community. Um, and so that was really important to me, uh, getting involved in these experiences uh, gave me really, um, good insight and knowledge uh, that can't be learned in the classroom. Um, and so I really credit a lot of this involvement with helping with my professional development over the years. So like Dr. Quinter mentioned, I did do some Oregon Space Grant research, uh, specifically with building a new trade map with an Upper Empire Lake. Um, so I was able to be on a team with a couple other uh, SWAC students, Tyrone Stagner and Quinn Sinard. And we were able to write a proposal and actually get money to do this project. So that was super cool. It was my first uh, sort of grant writing that I've ever done. Um, and so our project was proposed to create a nutrient map to assess the nutrient composition of Empire Lake. And so to do so, what we did was we collected different water samples uh, and analyzed the macronutrients in them uh, and different heavy metals as well. Um, and so then we also used a drone. It was kind of cool to kind of map uh, Upper Empire Lake. And so this was really great because after all of this research, uh, I was able to go up to the uh, Oregon State University for the student symposium for the Oregon Space Grant Consortium. Uh, and I got to present there. So I got to make my first ever academic poster and then give my first ever presentation. So it was really cool and it's really awesome to see how far I've come with this. Um, I'm definitely not as nervous as I once was, so it does get better. Um, and then I was also part of the SPEAR research team. So my time with the SPEAR research team was pretty short, thanks to COVID. Uh, so I only got to participate in one balloon launch, but it was really awesome. And I think we set the record that year for our highest balloon launch. I think we should let the school record. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Even cooler. So yeah, as I mentioned, my last year at SWAC ended up getting cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I ended up moving home for the remainder of the year where I finished my classes online. And then I began taking online classes from the University of Wyoming that fall to pursue a degree in microbiology. So I do just want to point out that yes, Wyoming is real. It does exist. So it's this uh, state there in the red and where the University of Wyoming is, it's in a town called Laramie. And it's denoted where that star is. So during that fall semester, uh, I received an email about a fellowship to be part of a team to design a payload for a high altitude weather balloon. And I remember feeling so excited uh, because my time in Sphere was cut short. So I wanted to really be involved with high altitude balloon launches again. Um, so I ended up applying and shortly after I got the position, um, which I can totally thank to the, uh, for Dr. Pointer's help with that. Um, best part was when I got offered this position, I was told that I would be on a team tasked to design a payload that would capture microbes from the stratosphere. Uh, so I was really stoked not only to get to do balloon work again, but I also got to use microbiology with it. Um, as well with this uh, fellowship that I was part of, we also got to do a lot of cool STEM outreach. So this was a collaborative project with Laramie High School. We got to do balloon launches all across the state of Wyoming. And then I also got to help out with the science kitchen. It is an organization at the University of Wyoming where they do a lot of cool STEM outreach for the students um, around the state. Um, so here are some pictures from one of our balloon launches. This was up in Thermopolis, Wyoming. 
Um, and so we did a high altitude balloon launch with the entire elementary school. Uh, so we ended up having four or five payloads attached to the balloon. And they were each filled with very obscure objects because the students all picked them out. So there was things like shaving cream, uh, little trinket toys, and then there was also some candy because the students really wanted to eat some candy that had gone into space. So uh, back to the actual project itself. Our goal was to uh, have this payload capture microbes from the stratosphere, so between 20,000 feet to 40,000 feet, and to get in the mesosphere from 60,000 feet to 80,000 feet. So to do so, we had two sampling chambers that had greased sampling rods that would collect the microbes. Uh, the chambers were powered by a servo motor, which was driven by a program of Duino. And before the launch, the payload was autoclaved to make sure all the bacteria in the payload was killed and that we had a sterile environment. So lucky for me, I didn't focus too much on the mechanical part because my team also consisted of a mechanical engineering student as well as an astrophysics student. So they kind of took care of the 3D printing and uh, programming stuff. So I got to instead optimize the sampling protocol for culturing the microbes that we were to catch and then a lot of the outreach activities. So one cool thing that we got to do was um, we actually got to test our uh, payload in uh, an atmospheric chamber. So they have one at the University of Wyoming. So here it is, and we were just making sure that the uh, little chambers would be able to open at those high pressures and uh, low temperatures. All right, so one of the best parts of this project was getting to work with uh, the high school students at Laramie High School. So we partnered up with the grade nine atmospheric science class. Um, and so while they didn't help us make the payload, we got to teach the students about our project and they got to launch the payload with us when we did that later that year. Um, and so in order for our students to understand the project, we got to give them several lessons about microbiology, engineering, 3D printing, all of this great stuff. And so it ended up uh, also having a lot of hands-on activities. And one of my favorites that I got to do was teach the students how to swab. So we took a bunch of auger petri dishes and we swabbed various items from across uh, the room. And then I let those sit in my basement for a couple weeks and then we saw what grew. And it was pretty disgusting, everything that grew there. But the kids had fun, so it was really cool to see. So we ended up doing the launch at the end of November of 2021. If you've ever been to Laramie during that time, you know how miserable the weather can be. I remember this day being so cold, I was layered up so much, but it was a really successful launch. So here's a little video to show kind of how it went. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, so yeah, that was the video of how our flight went. So our balloon reached a maximum height of 91,788 feet. And it traveled about 100 miles east into Nebraska, reaching top speeds of 100 miles per hour. So thanks Wyoming Wind for that. Um, so we went and retrieved the payload that day. And so once we got it back to Laramie, I took the chambers to the lab where I prepared them for incubation. So here is a little video to kind of show what that looked like. So this ended up being a pretty tedious process because as you can see, everything was bolted into the payload. So uh, because it had to be a completely sterile environment to be able to incubate these microbes, I had to do it in the biocontainment hood. So that way our samples weren't getting contaminated with any microbes that were in the lab. Um, so I took the grease rods out of each chamber and I put them into conical tubes with a PBS solution. So that just easily allows the microbes to strip from those grease rods. Um, you'll see in a minute here that I ended up vortexing the tubes. It's really fun to do. Um, it kind of makes a little, uh, little whirlpool within the samples. And so it just really helps to just speed up that process of stripping the microbes off of the tube or the rods. Um, so after that, I then took some of the microbe PBS mixture and I plated that on some Aussie Petri dishes and I put those in the incubator. Uh, the rest of that supernatant was then put into a liquid broth and it was incubated and shaken for several days. So then after that broth had been shaking and incubating for about a week, um, I took the optical density reading uh, to see if any bacteria had formed. Notice if it's turbid, then we know that there's bacteria growing. Um, so once I confirmed that there was some growth, I then plated some of that broth onto the auger plates and incubated those again uh, to see if we could get some colonies to grow. Unfortunately, we didn't get very good growth uh, initially, so our results were a bit inconclusive. So uh, it was kind of a bummer, but hopefully if there is another team who takes this on, they can optimize the protocol just a bit better. All right, so after our, the lift project was done, I transitioned to other research opportunities. And so this time I was in a molecular biology lab. So I was able to do research that was paid through the Wyoming INBRI, uh, which is the idea network for biomedical research excellence. And many universities have this uh, grant in place. So transfer to a four-year university, I highly recommend seeking out this opportunity if you are interested in biomedical research. Um, so with this project, I got to work with a bacteria called Coxiella brunetti. Um, Coxiella brunetti is a zoonotic, or it causes a zoonotic disease known as hay fever. And so humans can get this disease from infected goats, cows, and sheep. Um, luckily, it's not very prevalent in the United States. Uh, often, farmers and ranchers are the ones who are getting it. Uh, also, uh, this disease most people are typically fine if they do get acute fever. However, there can be a chronic disease that can occur, which can cause myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart, as well as hepatitis, which is inflammation of the liver. So to better understand um, this project, we need to understand the lifestyle of Coxiella. So it has two forms, the small cell variant, which is the metabolically inert um, version. So it cannot replicate within cells, it has to, and it um, is very environmentally stable. So it can withstand very harsh environmental uh, environments for several days. Um, and then it transitions to that large cell variant, and that's the variant that can replicate within the cells. So it specifically infects macrophages, which are a type of immune cell. And so basically what you see here, um, so Coxiella brunetti is that little green guy at the top, and he gets taken up into the macrophage, and then he gets into what's called a lysosome. So it's just this little vacuole that uh, the macrophage uses to engulf the bacteria to try and degrade the bacteria. However, Coxiella really likes to be in this vacuole, and it'll actually decrease the pH and make it a more acidic environment, which then allows that small cell variant to transition to that large cell variant, and then be able to replicate within the cell. And so the way it's able to do this is due to a gene called GAC-C. 
Um, so DAC-C plays a very important role in the cross-linking of the cell wall. Um, and so DAC-C also allows the bacteria to resist those macrophage killing mechanisms. So my old boss, Dr. Elizabeth Case, had found a mutant form of Proxyella um, that had a mutated DAC-C gene. So this made it more prone to be killed by the macrophages, um, and it decreased the cell wall um, integrity. So this is kind of what these graphs over here are showing. So we have two different cell lines that we used. We used hero cells. And just a little short thing about hero cells, they are cells that any type of bacteria or virus can replicate in. So they aren't very good for showing true infection, but it's good to show that your bacteria can replicate. Whereas bone marrow derived macrophages is what Coxiella typically likes to replicate in. So we have the black line that is the nine mile two strain, also known as the wild type strain of Coxiella. So that just means that this is the Coxiella that does not have the defect in DAC C gene. So what we see in the Vero cells compared to the yellow line, which is our mutant form of the DAC C gene. We have way more replication in the wild type strain compared to the DAC-C defective gene. And then in the bone marrow derived ones, we see a very significant reduction in replication in that mutated form. So to really see if DAC-C is the culprit for this decreased uh, replication abilities, we had to do what's known as a plasmid based complementation to Coxiella. So, Bear with me, we will get through this together. So uh, to do this, we had to create a plasmid. So a plasmid is essentially just a circular bacterial genome that can, uh, can occur in nature, but they can also be manipulated in science to add in specific gene targets to transform the bacteria. So our plasmid construct had our defected DAC-C gene denoted as 1261 uh, up here. So this is our uh, vector backbone, or plasma backbone. And with some TCR and a restriction digest, we're able to open up this vector and then insert that DAC seed mutated gene. So then once we have a bunch of that DNA made where it has the plasmid and that uh, mutated gene, we can then put it into our Coxiella cells. So to do that, we have to uh, basically zap the bacteria to allow the plasmids to get in. Um, so that's called electroporation. It's up there under 4A. And so then we are able to put the transformed Coxiella in a special broth that has specific markers on it. Um, this is to ensure that we know that Coxiella has that actual plasmid. And so an easy way to do that is to utilize uh, the biochemistry that the bacteria uses. So for example, Coxiella naturally does not utilize the amino acid arginine. So in our uh, plasmid, we put in an arginine gene, um, and then we can put the Coxiella in an arginine supplemented broth. And so if our Coxiella does have that plasmid in it, it'll be able to grow because it can use that arginine. But our Coxiella that does not have the plasmid will not be able to grow because they won't have an energy source to do so. So um, after that, it takes a really long time to grow Coxiella. It's a very slow growing bacteria. Typically with E. coli, you can get growth within 24 hours. Coxiella, it takes almost 14 days. Um, so this whole process took me about a year to complete. Um, being able to transform bacteria is a very finicky and difficult thing to do. Um, so there is a grad student currently working on this now. So hopefully she can determine that Daxi is the culprit for this. So be on the lookout for a paper in the next few years about that. All right, so big question. What about bobcats? We've talked about high altitude balloons and microbes, but how do bobcats fit into this talk? Well, now I'm doing research um, on a disease known as chronic wasting disease, and I'm using bobcats in my study. Um, so before I jump into talking about my current research that I'm doing, I want to focus on how these experiences uh, I've told you about and how they've shaped me into the scientist I am today. So for starters, my time at SWOC really helped uh, me gain vital research experience that later helped me with other projects. 
So especially with the Lyft project and the Inbury research. Um, having that early exposure to research, regardless of the field, I think is so important because it teaches you how to critically think and apply knowledge from the classroom to a real world problem. And it really helps you to start, apply, uh, start applying science to your everyday thinking, which I think is a really great thing to do. Um, as well, it really taught me how to have work-life balance. As an early scientist in academia, you have a lot you have to do. Uh, so as a grad student right now, I have tasks all the time. Uh, so I'm taking classes, I'm conducting research, I'm writing about my research, um, I'm a teaching assistant, and then to make myself even busier, I still like to be involved with a bunch of different clubs on campus, um, as well as STEM outreach. So it can be a lot to juggle, but my involvement at, my, um, at SWAC during my time here really helped me figure out that work-life balance. Um, and it really taught me that you don't need to work incredibly hard to be successful, but rather work smarter by finding the skills that work best for you to be efficient with your time. Um, lastly, and I think this is one of the biggest ones, is that it's okay to change your mind on what you want to do. When I started at SWAC, I really thought I was going to be a marine biologist, but that quickly changed after I took Dr. Springer's chemistry class. His enthusiasm for chemistry just really got me fired up and it was something I really wanted to pursue. Um, oops. <laughs> um, and so, again, I changed my mind after I took Dr. Brouse's micro microbiology course, and I realized bacteria was my true passion. Um, as well as my experiences at the University of Wyoming also shifted my plans. I thought for sure I'd stay in uh, microbiology, but now I'm working with wildlife disease, and I couldn't be happier. Regardless, if I didn't have these research and academic, academic experiences, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. So I can really thank SWAC and all of the wonderful people here for helping me lead me to the path I'm on today. So my advice for you all is to just get involved, regardless of uh, whether the project will directly help or to your goals. Being involved with research and opportunities that you're passionate about, regardless of your knowledge with it, is so valuable will help fuel your passion for research and expose you to many exciting um, experiences and people that may just change the trajectory of your path. So now let's get back to bobcats. So as I mentioned before, I am studying a disease known as chronic wasting disease, and I'm looking at the role bobcats play in the ecology of chronic wasting disease. So before we can begin to understand this project, we first have to talk about what prions are. So prions are a unique pathogen as they don't contain nucleic acid like viruses and bacteria do. They're actually just an infectious uh, protein particle. Um, so this is showing that, uh, this is showing our a mammal brain because all mammals have normal cellular prion proteins uh, that are part of the central nervous system. So they play a vital role in neuronal homeostasis, and they keep everything functioning properly. However, we can get misfolded prion proteins that can cause a lot of harm to the body. So once these infectious prion proteins, or most misfolded proteins, are present in the central nervous system, they're going to convert all of these normal prion proteins to that infectious one when they come into contact with it. And it's going to cause something called an amyloid plaque formation. So these amyloid plaques cause neurodegeneration. Uh, so it causes these little holes to form in the brain. Um, and so this happens over time. These misfolded proteins accumulate and then cause this significant neurodegeneration. Uh, besides chronic wasting disease, or I will refer to it in this present presentation as CWD, there are lots of other prion diseases that affect a lot of other mammals. So one you may be familiar with is called bovine spongy form encephalopathy, or better known as mad cow disease. Uh, humans can get a bunch of prion diseases as well. One of the most notable ones is creutzfeldt jakob disease. Uh, but don't fret, prion diseases are very rare in humans, and many of them are genetically acquired. So let's talk about what CWD is. So CWD is a disease of cervix. Um, it is also known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, 
And that just means it causes holes to form in the flame. It has an incubation period of about 18 to 24 months in here, but this incubation period is dependent on species and then genotype as well. Um, so this disease can be transmitted through direct contact with infected cervids. Should also mention cervids are deer, elk, moose, and caribou. Um, so when these cervids get into contact with each other, nose-to-nose -nose contact, they can transmit it to each other that way, as well as eating each other's antler velvet. Um, as well, they can uh, get a lot of indirect transmission as well. So cervids begin to excrete infectious prion proteins in the early stages of the disease, about three months post-infection, and then they progressively shed more and more of these prions into the environment until they ultimately die. Um, as well as decomposing carcasses that are CWD positive can create hot spots across the landscape. Um, it's also important to note as well that prions are super, super resistant. They can stay, they can withstand uh, some of the harshest environmental stressors, and they can remain infectious in the environment for decades. So this creates a really big issue because there is a lot of transmission routes. Uh, that can also be an um, indirect uh, correlation as well. So we can have insects and scavengers and predators that could potentially impact chronic wasting disease and increase prevalence or decrease it. I'll talk more about that in a bit. So uh, with all of this environmental contamination, managing CWD is very difficult. Um, so the only ways we can actually get rid of CWD prions is through bleach or incineration. So we can't really do that to the environment. Um, so we are looking at different ways we can possibly manage this. Uh, so this is just a map here showing all of the CWD positive areas in the United States and Canada. And as you can see here, Wyoming in the middle there is just covered with CWD. Luckily though, Oregon is CWD free still. And that is thanks to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. They're doing an excellent job with surveillance and prevention of this disease into the elk and deer populations. But unfortunately for Wyoming, we're kind of a lost cause because all of our deer and elk populations have been impacted CWD. We have some herds in the western part of the state that have a prevalence of over 60%, which is crazy. Um, and so because this disease is so hard to limit from the environment, my research is looking at the potential benefits predators and scavengers may have on this disease and their potential ways to eliminate it from the landscape. So not much has been uh, researched with the role that these animals play in the ecology of CWD. So there's a couple different uh, there's some potential benefits that they may have and some potential challenges. So I'm really looking to see all aspects and see if the benefits outweigh the challenges. So some of the potential benefits that I'm hoping to see in my research is that um, the scavengers and predators are able to do selective predation. So when an animal is sick, especially with CWD, they're going to get really, really, uh, their mobility is going to really uh, significantly decrease. So it makes them more susceptible to being dated on or getting hit by a car. Um, as well as it's also great that a lot of scavenging animals will consume these carcasses. So that could also be a potential way to remove this chronic wasting disease off of the landscape. However, we still have to acknowledge the potential challenges um, that are posed with the disease dynamics. So these animals could potentially act as mechanical vector and move chronic wasting disease to new areas that may have minimal to no prevalence of CWD. And so they could do this by consuming an animal and then pooping out a lot of prions onto the landscape and a deer can come and become infected that way. So if this is the case, we want to also know if the excreted prions are infectious or not. So that kind of brings me to my research question. I'm curious what the precise role bobcats play in chronic wasting disease ecology. Are they helping limit the spread by reducing the amount of prions that are uh, excreted out in their feces, or are they serving as a mechanical vector for CWD transmission into new areas? So to be able to address these questions, we had to do a couple different things. 
First, we had to do an intestinal transit time of the bobcats that we have for the study. And then we had to do our bobcat feeding trial. So basically, I took a bunch of CWD positive and negative tissues, and I made them into uh, a slurry, is essentially what it is. So then we were able to spike that with the ground diet that the bobcats eat and feed them that. Uh, then we took their fecal samples for an entire week, and then I was able to analyze those in an assay called RT Quick, and then I was able to do some statistical analysis. So to start with that intestinal transit time, um, so I have four captive bobcats that I'm using for this project. The Wyoming Game and Fish Department has these animals at one of their research centers, so we're using them for this study. Um, so three of our four bobcats were fed blue dyed meat, and then their scat was collected daily and the dye was visually assessed to determine the intestinal transit time. So it took about 48 hours or two days. And fun fact, this is actually the same as a house cat's intestinal transit time. Next, what I did was I got my CWP positive and negative tissues. And in this case, we used elk retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Um, so these usually have a pretty high concentration of CWP prions. So they're a good tissue to use for this study as well. Um, Scavenging animals probably aren't going to be able to get to the brain to eat of these animals, but they'll get some lymph nodes so that can greatly uh, decrease the amount of CWD that is on the landscape. So I took my lymph nodes and I put them in a magic bullet with some PBS and I ground them up that way. And then I assessed them in the RT quick assay to quantify my starting concentration of prions. So just a little bit about RT Quick 101. So RT Quick stands for Real Time Protein Induced Conversion, and it is a prion amplification assay. So if we look at this picture over here, let's say this is our sample here, and we have that pink infectious form of the prion protein. We supplement our um, assay with a recombinant prion protein, that one in the green. So that's mimicking the cellular prion protein but it's made just to be a little bit unstable. So if it does come into contact with that infectious one, it can then convert to that infectious form pretty quickly. So once we have enough of those uh, infectious forms stacking on top of each other, creating those amyloid plaque formations, we have a fluorescent dye in our assay that's going to bind to those and we'll get a nice positive curve like we see over here. So, Essentially what you need to know for this assay is that positive samples give us this nice uh, amplification curve and then our samples that don't have any chronic wasting disease present will give us a flat line like this. So here are the results from those uh, lymph nodes that I had homogenated to feed to the bobcats. So all of our positive samples um, I had to run them at different dilutions to be able to actually quantify the concentration. So just ignore that for now. But we got amplification in all of our samples, and then our negative one stayed sam negative, which was good to know that we weren't potentially contaminating our samples and giving our negative bobcat some CWD prions to eat. So after that, three of our four bobcats got that positive lymph node homogenate. And then we had our fourth bobcat get that negative homogenate. So the good folks with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, they collected fecal samples twice a day for a total of seven days. And then I got those samples and ran them in the RT quick assay. And it's also important to note as well, I was blinded to which animals were positive and which ones were fed the negative uh, lymph nodes. So I took those fecal samples and I made what I like to call poop soup. Uh, it's basically just a homo homogenized version of the fecal samples from the bobcats. And then I can run it in the RT quick assay. So because I didn't know which of my animals were positive and which ones were negative, I started running everything at the same concentration at a 10 to negative three dilution. So since I use a 96 well plate, and I have to use, uh, put my samples on so many times, I was able to fit all of my day one to day four morning samples. 
So as you can see here, we had two bobcats that were positive on day one and day two. So that was bobcat one and bobcat two. But then bobcat three and four were negative from day one to day four. And then bobcat one and two, who were positive those two days, were negative for the rest of the time. And so you might be wondering, I thought you fed them three of the bobcats positive uh, lymph nodes. Yes, but we had some technical difficulties. Bobcats are super sneaky, so the two lady bobcats, they are housed together in the same den. So the one decided to get an extra breakfast that morning. So we ended up with two negative controls and two positive controls. We have since fixed that and made sure that we can separate them for our pre next feeding trials. And we also have trail cameras up so we can make sure that they're eating their own meals. So what I did next, I had to further quantify uh, these results. So to do that, I took my positive samples, Bobcat 2 and Bobcat 1 on day 1 and day 2, and I ran those at further dilutions so I could do my statistical analysis. So these are the results from that. Uh, purple is the day 1 samples and black is the day 2. And just from these graphs, we can already see that there's significant reduction of prion seeding activity. So Bobcat 1, we had a lot of positive dilutions at those day 1 samples. But on day two, we only had amplification at that 10 to the negative three dilution. The same for Bobcat two over here as well. So as I mentioned, Bobcat one was a naughty Bobcat. So we couldn't uh, fully quantify her SD50, seeding dose 50. This is just the uh, quantification we use uh, to be able to determine the prion CD concentration. So because we weren't sure how much Bobcat 1 actually ate, we aren't sure she got a full double dose or not, we decided to exclude her from these preliminary results and just create an SD50 calculation with Bobcat 2. So if you look all the way to the left over there at the percentage SD50, we started off with an initial concentration with our CWP positive lymph node at 100%. By day one, we only recovered 1.3%. And by day two, 0.7%. So this is a huge reduction compared to that initial 100% that we fed the Bobcats. So what does this mean? So as I mentioned, captive Bobcats have an intestinal transit time of 48 hours. And our preliminary trial suggests that less than 2% of prions can be recovered after they passage through the GI tract of the bobcats. So this indicates that bobcats may be able to reduce the environmental prion <coughs> burden through the consumption of CWD carcasses. And it is unlikely that these animals act as a mechanical vector as the prions are only detected in scat two days after consumption and also at very, very low doses. So, this is great news for bobcats and other predators. Maybe other data and research like this will continue to go on, and it can be a fighting chance for bobcat, mountain lion, and other predator populations to rise again. So thank you so much for being here and letting me talk and nerd out about all my favorite research. Um, I will take any questions that you have, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, microbes. So those are bacteria. So germs. Um, the yeah. bobcats. So they. That's fascinating that they excrete less prions, and that's uh -huh. a good sign. So say we're a coyote were to eat the same carcass, do we know would it leave more prions in its um, excrement? So there's current research going on right now with that. Um, so past research has looked at just determining if there's prions present or not. So they did do a, a study with coyotes back in the early 2000s. And basically they concluded that infectious prions are still able to leave isolated after they keep them out. But it could be at lower quantifications like the bobcats. Yeah. So the quantification you use that's, that only affects uh, cervix, it doesn't affect like the things that eat them or no, so so far we're only seeing it with cervix. There's not been that species jump. But if you are a hunter, it is recommended not to eat so you can give positive meat. Uh, so, I almost hate to ask this question because it feels like asking you to go back to your, your, your favorite kid and your favorite pet. But what was your favorite project out of all the projects that we've talked about today? Oh, I really think the Bobcat one's been my favorite. It's super cool to really see like a real world application with it. Chronic wasting disease is such a big issue in Wyoming. Um, we have a really big economy with hunting, so it really impacts the hunting industry. And yes. You mentioned that those bobcats aren't exactly friendly, and there's a snow shovel involved, so keep yes. them at bay and fill yeah. them out. Yeah, so I've been able to go out there a few times to collect their food and feed them, and they're all housed separately, but they are not friendly. The one lady bobcat um, from this picture, if I can get to it real quick, real mean looking one. does that every time. She just gets up there and starts hissing. I don't think I've ever heard her not hiss before. So two people always have to go in and use a snow shovel to defend ourselves in case. Well, she decided not to eat meat to be conserved. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for the uh, transformation stuff, do you have two different deposits to get better results with one deposit over the other? Yeah, so we used one that just had that DAC C gene, the 1261, but then we made another plasmid uh, that had a different vector backbone, but then we also had the upstream and downstream genes from 1261. Um, and I found the one that just had 1261 was better because it was smaller base pairs. Uh, yeah, Proxiello is also just a very good Another question I just want to make uh, you aware the uh, the mineral thing for Empire Lake that you did. I uh, actually had work where I used your research. Oh, so that's awesome! Stuff. So you're you're still affecting swab too. Oh well, that is great to hear. I'm glad that data can be used too. We still have a copy of the book for you. So. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see, what was I going to say here? Uh, yeah, so the, the image of the CWD brain, infected brain, was really dramatic, the holes in it. Um, mm -hmm. When cervids are experiencing that degree of yeah. loss, brain loss, uh, are they acting funny or is it... Yeah, so uh, let me go into this one picture up here. So this is an elk that's been affected. Um, and so as you can see, it's got a really droopy head. It's you can't really tell, but he's salivating a lot. They get really emaciated, so they get super skinny because they just lose motor function. They can't walk around very well. They just stop eating. And often, like, CWP is technically the cause of death, but they usually get other bacterial infections that cause them to die. So they usually get aspiration pneumonia because they can't swallow, and then they end up dying because of that. Or they get predated or hit by a car. And I forgot to mention as well that this is a 100% fatality uh, disease. There's no cure or anything to help with this. So it's a pretty big issue once it gets into the state. I, I 
It's just one last question about the, the hunters. Um, if they they're encouraged not to eat this meat, so there are they educated on it? Or are they yeah? Always, so hmm. I know the Wyoming Game and Fish Department does a really great job with informing the hunters. Uh, I know in areas where it's super super prevalent, they have to get their meat tested, and they can't process it until they get the results back. Okay. Uh, it varies state to state. I know. Uh, Colorado does a much better job at it and will compensate you if you do process your meat and it is negative. Wyoming doesn't do that, I believe. Uh, I'm so excited about like, when I first saw the, the high altitude limit just because that was like our very first project this year and we've done quite a few of the um, uh, balloons now and each time it's just always really exciting. We got what we did last year uh, we involved one of the classes that we're doing with uh, K-12 outreach and kind of talked to them and visit us, and that was really exciting. And that one, we actually ran out of helium because there's helium shortage locally. And we're like, oh, no, we're really sorry. But it was one of our highest ones. It didn't get to that that high, um, but uh, it, it was nice. like, actually close. It was only like was a half full or oh, oh, wow. Half full, yeah. That's but cute. the one that you were talking about, I the one that you're part of, uh, that was still to this day the highest, it's 90,000 feet uh, about that we got to, and it's, it's, it's really neat to, um, as it's going up, we were able to watch on, at our ground station on the computer, all the data start rolling in, it's really exciting, we're, we're kind of looking at other ways that we're going to be expanding with other projects for that, so it's something like that, I think it's just because it's I'm really excited about this project that you're or, I mean, that you're working on now, and just the you know veterinary medicine, and maybe one day we'll have that here. Yes. Um, and also, you know, because uh, I heard I guess the Oregon State has a really great program, maybe a partnership or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always great. So thank you very much for coming. I'm so excited um, that you were able to make it. Yes. I will say that, as, as, Crystal, as Crystal said, we are, we are super proud of you as, as uh, the development program and all that we have all the college and you're providing an example for many of our students that are, the students that are here, the students that are watching it, uh, um, one week later, uh, just to give them an idea of the very different things that they did that they didn't manage to do starting here, but getting getting their, themselves involved in various projects early on. And yeah. We thank you for kind of providing that level of mentorship that you just kind of It's always said. nice to see those different views because a lot of people think, oh, they're doing like space stuff or they're doing, you know, chemistry stuff or, you know, it's just like you can start anywhere but mm -hmm. just jumping in doing something and then you're like, whoa, this is like something new I'm interested in. Or just the experience you had when you do find that thing that interests you, you know, how it all kind of tied together, which we're seeing here. Yeah. And so this is kind of neat to see that full circle, and then it would be really cool, you know, to, to just continue to see that. So it's just super awesome. Mm -hmm. at, at some level, there's at least a significant percentage of science that is just learning how to do the scientific method and learning how to and learning how to think critically about oh, things. Time. Yeah. And then you get to and then you get to narrow things down as you find focus of who you are actually interested in. <laughs> yep. mm -hmm. so. But thank you very much for coming and thank you all very much for, for coming and participating and for those of you uh, watching at home, thank you for tuning in. <laughs> you have any further questions, um, if you want to get to hang around for a couple minutes, yeah. you can text us to her. Uh, you can also email us and we can reach out and uh, send the questions her way um, if you have any questions about her yeah, and feel free to send me emails as well about anything. If you're a student wanting to transfer and just curious about that process, just shoot me an email. I'd be happy to help. So thank you once again.